welcome to the course culturally responsive built environments and today we are going to discuss about power which is one of the important a crucial aspect in the cultural responsive built environments and today we are going to discuss about the power in built form before talking about how the power plays an important role in shaping the built environments or even the built forms within the architecture so i would like to give you a brief a philosophical understanding of what is this power and how it has been understood in fact one of the important contribution on this subject especially from the built environment course is from kim dovey a professor from australia uh, he developed a monograph of uh, framing places mediating a power in built form so this is a, a very rigorous work on how he used the space syntax analysis in analyzing various historic forms and uh, how it has an intercourse with uh, the spatial expressions you know so to start with uh, we'll talk about the power when we talk about the basic understanding of power it is referred as the capacity or the ability to achieve some end in fact even amartya sen talks about in his book development as freedom where he refers the development he refers to the ability to the access to its resources and uh, how one can manage to access to the resources so on a similar note it it is refers to the ability and how it defines and control the circumstances and events so that one can influence things to go in the direction of one's interest in fact uh, here there are two uh, kinds of power which dove talks about following on various anthropological literature on power and uh, he talks about Uh, power over and power to where in the power over it is basically of one's capacity to influence or to do things on the way he wants to do he wants to get it done so it is basically talks about uh, a capacity of one's to uh, so that he can make able to do get it done from the others but whereas when you talk about the power to it actually dictates the relationship between people so there is a very thin difference between this power over it's like a two sides of the same coin but one side it talks about the cap- capacity or the ability part of it and the other side of it is it's a kind of relationship so when we talk about the power to how i mean how we are getting a kind of interrelationship between the provider and the doer so in short we talk about the capacity to imagine to construct and inhabit a better built environments is what we mostly mean by empowerment here so in our later case when we talk about power to this is where we are talking about the empowerment how we can empower the people to be able to do certain things or to be able to modify certain uh, built environments now coming uh, directly into the built environment discussions here dove talks about forms of power over where he uses he tried to clarify it with some basic terminology which we use in our daily lives for instance force he refers force is an overt exercise which strips on the subject of any choice of non compliance and for instance from a built environment perspective if you give you an example of a prison it is limited a person who is subjected in the prison premises his movement and his freedom to do certain things his freedom to speak certain things you know there, there there is a certain limit of boundary which is defined within it and this is where because it is most common mediated of power in built form because it is subjected within these four walls or it is within the periphery of that compound it is also limited so that it can prevent certain action to happen so in this kind of thing what you can see is 
it is not just trying to prevent certain activities, but it is also, I mean, that is what Dove talks about. It can prevent action more easily than it can create it. So, in this particular form of force, there are certain impositions on the people or with it from its environments, how it is shaped. So, it is restricting certain actions, but it is not creating certain actions. So, that is what uh, Dove talks about. Whereas, in uh, the second uh, form, he talks about coercion. Defined as a threat of force to secure compliance and may be constructed as a latent kind of force. Here, the force is hidden. Like here, it could be expressed in some few ways. One is domination or intimidation, where the forms of architecture, urban design and spatial behavior can signify a threat of force. For instance, when we talk about domination, especially the monumental statues or the monumental buildings, which reflects certain domination of a power, you know, where for instance, if you are talking about 2010 Moscow Victory Parade, which was actually held on 9th May 2010, it is actually demonstrating, it is, uh, it is being conducted to commemorate the 65th anniversary of the capitulation of Nazi army. So basically, uh, almost, we are nearing to almost uh, uh, 70 years now, and uh, but still, you know, 60 to 70 years down the line, they are trying to mark their Soviet Union's victory in the Great Patriotic War. So in that way, even certain marches, the, the grand honors and all these things, so they are all uh, talking, they are all performed in a particular place, but the meaning behind this march is something else. The meaning something else is the four, the, I mean, the earlier discussed force version is hidden component in it. So it has an indirect implication of what it is performed here. And now I would like to discuss the second category is called manipulation, which, um, so here it it is a kind of the process how it which operates primarily by keeping the subject ignorant. So I'll give you a small case study of our own uh, right now it is the study is uh, happening with uh, I'm working with one of my co-partner from Istanbul Technical University Dilek Ildej has uh, been from since 2014 we've been working on this project so we'll just see how the transformation and how the we can I can explain better in the manipulation component of it. Now what you see here is in Istanbul, heart of Istanbul, and this is called uh, Taksim Square, and this is referred as one of the important monument or in the history of Turkey. It is like one of the heart of Istanbul, but people often refer it as the brain of Turkey. So it is a kind of national symbol for Turkey. It is, it is acting as a kind of national symbol or even to outreach any particular voice. So it is one of the symbolic uh, identical future. And what you see here is uh, 1937s. You can see a kind of uh, uh, a building which is uh, during the time of uh, Ottoman Sultan Selim III in somewhere it was built in 1806. This is actually a military barracks which was designed by an Armenian architect Kirkur Balian and which is inspired by both Indian, Russian and also the Turkish architecture. So what happened in this particular case we are going to discuss about the whole transformation how this building has performed and what is the current status of that particular place. Now, since 1929 uh, and 1930s, where Henry Prost have uh, developed a new master plan of uh, Istanbul and then he actually nominated certain buildings to get demolished. And in that process, uh, ob in that process, this whole building has got for some, maybe in around in before 1940s, a part of the building got damaged, and later on, a series of events have occurred, and which also have created certain memories within the communities. 
For instance, we talk about uh, in February 16, 1969, about 150 leftist demonstrators were injured during the clashes with the right-wing groups in what they call it as a Bloody Sunday and uh, in events known as Taksim Square Massacre because these particular squares, how they become more famous. Today we talk about the Labor Day, May 1, 1997, 1977, where almost uh, 500,000 people have gathered and 36 left-wing demo were killed by unidentified and eligible right-wing gunmen on the square during the Labor Day. So if you look at the photographs uh, which I uh, procured from Dilek, uh, where she have collected from some other archives uh, work. And so this important uh, events of huge massacres have been in the memory of Turkish people and it has created certain myths and how they have been translated into generation to generation and that's how whenever uh, when we talk about the Taksim Square. So here it is not, the moment we are talking about this particular building of uh, the military barracks, it is very much associated with uh, the square, you know. We can't just isolate the building and talk, uh, isolate from the square because the square play becomes a national identity, uh, a symbol of the national identity. Um, now, in, there was a exhibition um, in the Salt Gallery in Istanbul, where they actually started uh, explaining about how this whole transformation of this area have been and the military barracks have been taken place. So, starting from uh, almost from the Ottoman side, it was uh, a barrack, and later, because of uh, in 31st March around uh, 1909, there was an attack on this military barrack because. Uh, that time the, there was a conflict between the conservative ideologies and the kind of uh, socialistic ideologies and part of it got demolished and uh, a small, I mean, uh, uh, a, a small attack happened and then there was an internal, I mean, this internal courtyard uh, has started uh, used as a, you can see here, the football. So this was the first football stadium in Turkey. And so the military barracks have gradually uh, started uh, working as a football stadium and so that uh, you know, certain sportive activities do take place. And in 1928, the opening of Taksim Square have taken place and that is where at the same time, Henry Prost was working on the master plan of uh, Istanbul and that is where he brought an Italian architect to make this kind of monument. And the, the crystal casino was constructed and then finally what you see here is the military barracks was demolished. So initially the first part was demolished and later the full part was demolished. So now. Uh, after that, what they started doing is around 1940s, uh, this was developed into a kind of park. And then after a series of demolitions have taken place in Istanbul, and obviously this whole place have become a kind of uh, maidan. And later, much later, they did construct the Ataturk Cultural Center so that it defines the space of the Medan. And uh, so that is how the transformation uh, happened. So now the story, this whole transformation was being um, uh, visualized in the exhibition, the way it was portrayed. They call in different phases the very key milestones. This 1803 to 1940, the Taksim is referred as a new squire. So, and then and the 1940, because see, in why we are talking about 1803, in fact, uh, the Taksim name comes from, there used to be a huge kind of uh, structure of water reservoir called Maksim, and uh, which, uh, uh, which was a kind of distribution component. So that is where the water is used to distribution. So even here now, the Taksim comes from, that is the uh, way it distributes. So ideally, uh, linguistically, it is referred to uh, Taksim as a distribution, but one look at that square, so the moment you are passing from the park and anywhere, the moment you reach to the square, you can actually orient yourself to which part of the city you are going. So that is how literally also that is a square which actually distributes you to and it orients you to go into different directions of the city, different parts of the city. Whereas uh, in 1940, we that is where uh, the Turkey is uh, um, a prominence into the republic, that is where the square of the republic 
and in 1967 to 1980 when the squall of rizer and whereas in 1960s whereas in where we are talking the nearing to the uh, labor day uh, massacres and all that is where it becomes a political square so now in today if we talk about 1986 to 2012 this is the square of everything so if you look at the transformations of from the new square to the square of the republic and to the square of leisure the square of political square and to the square of everything so what is happening in this gaji park is um, uh, this is now this was a present situation around 2012 until 2012 and uh, you can see this has become a kind of a green access to the other part of the city and so in that way this whole uh, network has i mean that is the only large green space uh, probably in the hard core of istanbul so now what Um, there has been some observations from various communities which we interviewed with the local shopkeepers and other places they feel that you know uh, they had a lot of memories even in the gaji park because maybe when they were born they have not seen the military barracks but still there some myths were transited but what they have seen is their experience is the gaji park they some people have celebrated their weddings there some people have their associations uh, spending their leisure time with the families and at the same time people working in istanbul technical university or even the behind the hotels and all other thing they have Uh, they have their memories in passing through the park and uh, relaxing through the park so at some point of the time um, for some reason or the other reason uh, some of the community i mean the stakeholders communities they observe that this is not well maintained so the one side of it is a kind of leisure space the other side of it is also a kind of uh, in the evening time some activities for the some brokers of for prostitution and some drugs so there are also we heard uh, two kinds of voices from both the sides so people have opined that to some extent some have this was little the maintenance aspect has been uh, ignored but then um, in the recent development what uh, uh, the, the turkish government uh, the dogans uh, government what they are looking at is how we can redevelop this how we can restitute uh, as a restitution project and uh, so so in the uh, in the stretch of constructing various historic buildings which were lost or which were damaged or which were uh, demolished by the bomb construction the bomb destruction due to the bombs right so there are many various efforts to rebuild those buildings so regain uh, and, and restitute so in the similar fashion they also proposed with an architect uh, and then they're trying to have this kind of proposal bring back that same identity here and and this is how the proposal is all about uh, so basically the center park remains as a kind of paved platform and a little greenery will be there and all the same military barracks form of a building will come back again and this is how uh, what you see on the left hand side is uh, from the architects work which we collected some information on how it can retain back its identity and what you see is uh, atatürk um, cultural center that actually defined the um, uh, the maidan's uh, premises it defines an edge so now everything good but you know now what is the response what they have observed in 2013 and 14 time is people started revolting what you see is people are actually revolting in with a uh, standing in silence you know they are not moving so they are doing a lot of rules so i was little puzzled to what was wrong so there was a uh, the media reports talk about there was a gap between how it was not communicated to the communities how this whole proposal and because they were planning to cut down a few trees so and they are uh, you losing that green spaces so that is where the whole community have responded to it and they have protested like you can see that the whole istical street people started protesting by standing and just reading books and you know this is a kind of protest which have taken place and that time obviously the um, government have taken a serious serious 
I mean, uh, to stop these activities, they even use some kind of pressure waters or, you know, to send them out. And uh, at some point, they even, even brought their kids and children. They put, they put their tents and they started living in the park. And, you know, so this is a kind of various kinds of protest which did occur. And with this process, what you can see here is uh, whether before this protest, whether uh, people are aware of uh, the green, the importance of green or not, is uh, was a question. But because of this uh, situation, people started, you know, uh, learning about, uh, learning about, and getting some awareness on the importance of the green in the urban situations. But here, why I'm referring with the manipulation is here. There is also the hidden stories of how the bringing back those Ottoman uh, periods in the heart of Istanbul, which is a kind of uh, a place prominent with its national identity, and uh, whether they really want that kind of conservative images to be present in their city or not, is also a, a questionable. And whether people have protested for the sake of trees, yes, most of the cases, many of them, because that is how the media have uh, worked out and people have realized the awareness of uh, tree, I mean, the importance of trees. But, but uh, is it only for the trees or is there anything the hidden? This is where the latent kind of imaginations, that is one has to investigate that. And so in the previous example, we just talked about how even if the architects knew that, yes, or if uh, the government knew that bringing back that situation also uh, has some implications on getting some ideologies of the lost power or lost reign. Uh, so this is, uh, this is also, I, I would call it a kind of, if it was true, then it would a kind of manipulated form of restitution or otherwise. Uh, how people have understood, how you have taken it. Maybe the trees could be the cause, but there could be some other political reasons uh, could be one has to investigate. And uh, uh, the other form of force, which we call seduction, where uh, it is a practice which manipulates the interest and desires of a subject. So here it actually relies on interaction and acknowledgement of both real and unreal and pleasure and pain, limit and limitless, and material and immaterial. So how it can produce the sensory understanding and how it, the place can actually seduce, uh, I mean, it has a potential to seduce. It is slightly different from a kind of unlike the manipulation because it does not deceive, but it can at least have a put a controlled range of uh, you know, uh, an interaction and as well as the acknowledgement of both the imaginary and the real one. Whereas in the uh, authority, when we talk about authority, it is a form of power which is integrated with institutional structures of society such as state, church, private, corporation, school and family, you know. So, for instance, on the right-hand side, what you see is the Vatican City. I was on uh, St. Peter's, taking this photograph from the top of uh, St. Peter's Dome. And that's how the Vatican City, the whole uh, plaza and the way, the whole the street connections and the whole visual access is portrayed. Because in the Roman uh, times, how church is on the top of its the pyramid and how it has a notion of its power and how it is demonstrated through the built form. And that is where the authority also, because the scale of the building, the, 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 the way one's direction is uh, you know, taken in care of. And so it always talks about how a built form also can represent the authority. And, and here, when we talk about authority, it is marked, Dove recognizes uh, that it is marked by the absence of argument because you are on the power, you are on the higher power. And 
obviously the argument it miss it uh, is missing and then it relies on unquestioned recognition of compliance whatever the church says it has to be followed so it is not a two way process it is a one way process of it so now even in our family systems like if you talk about uh, the how the head of the family uh, how his decisions are valued and how it shows a direction to the rest and similarly in a, if you take a religious group or any other thing so the how the head of the religious group and a priest or uh, any swami and how his guidance will act as a kind of uh, not personable you know and this is where uh, dove brings for calls uh, or uh, you know how power is a tolerable only on a condition that it masks a sub substantial part of itself so the important component here is its success is proportional to its ability to hide its own mechanism so power has a role because the moment the authority might have certain ideologies or certain ideas behind it but it is hiding its own problems it own mechanisms so this is a where one can see that you know it it is prop so that's what uh, Foucault talks about. Its success is proportional to its ability to hide its own mechanisms. So here he refers to ability. And when we are talking in a built environment context, uh, he actually talks about the, how power naturally is and camouflages itself like a chameleon like construct. So the built form, so what you see in this picture is the chameleon adapts to the kind of nature it is crawling around and the, 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 so the moment it is going in a green texture so obviously it blends with the green uh, color. So uh, here what is important is the built form operates as a metaphor wherein it simultaneously represents and masks with association with power. So, in last, what he Dove talks in the in his uh, first chapter is about he sets the dimensions of place and power mediations, and uh, they necessarily not constituting a theory, but they should not be read as a deterministic. And these are the dimensions along which the dialects of power in places are played out. So, for instance, I'll just read out a few, and uh, in the following class, we'll be talking about some of the case studies and his methods of work. Like, for instance, orientation versus the disorientation. So, how built form can orient or disorient or reorient its subjects through the spatial framings of everyday life. So, how a particular passage can connect to the visual connections to it and how it can also disorient certain or it can also uh, you know if you are planning something uh, in a Muslim house obviously how the parda can actually can uh, the, the way it is oriented and how the gender component is not is protected you know. So similarly in the publicity and privacy built form segment space in a manner you know depends on various requirements of a particular groups or a particular historical mankind segregation and access again they are all interrelated of course what we are talking is are all interrelated the boundaries and the pathways can segregate places of interest like we talk about berlin wall so that is where we talk about the east germany and west germany where we talk about Nicosia, that's where we talk about the Turkish part of Cyprus and the Greek part of the Cyprus. And nature and historically constructed meanings can be naturalized to legitimize authority, you know, so how it has been rooted so that even the way we can legitimize. So this is where legitimizing traditions, you know, through which an authority is legitimized. Similarly, a stability and change. And we talk about the static part of it and the morphological aspect of it. So how it can produce the illusions of permanence and the dynamism and innovations. And it talks about the progress, the progress of the American nation, you know, how the whole built form talks and how certain materials also talks about uh, the transformation. And the authenticity and the fake. I think this is again how also one perceives it. And identity and difference, the politics of identity and difference is mediated in an arena of spatial representation with the time. And what time of this place is, you know, is it, are we talking about, when we talk about identity, the Ottoman has the same value of that Turkish building or the barracks uh, as of now, or is it, is it was something different? So dominant and docile, and that talks about the way the mass and volume 
and how it cannot be diverse from discourses of domination and intimidation. Place and ideology, how a physical place can open a question of spirit. So these are all uh, some of the dimensions and I acknowledge Kim Dovey's work on framing places, mediating power with built form. So in the I also thank Dilek Ildic for her contributions on the Taksim's work. Thank you very much and we'll see you in the next class on power and its case studies. Thank you.